Hi, I'm Hanson Hossein. I'm the co-founder of the Communication Leadership Graduate Program at the University of Washington. And I'm here to lead this really important conversation about misinformation and disinformation and how to talk to family and friends. Now, we've all experienced it. We're hanging out with our friends or our relatives are visiting and suddenly you hear something that's un you know, palpably untrue. And yet they say it with such uncertainty, we all really want to believe it. So what do we do about it? How do we manage these really close relationships? Well, luckily I'm joined by three global experts on the subject who can help us, give us a toolkit to, to figure this out. Uh, Maddie Jalbert is a postdoctoral scholar at the Center for an Informed Public. She has a background in social psychology and studies how context and our experiences influence our memory, judgment, and decision-making. And Kate Starbird is the current director for the Center of, an, uh, of the Center for an Informed Public. And Kate has great expertise in online disinformation, and especially in managing online rumors during crises. And Jevin West, like Kate, is a co-founder of the Center for an Informed Public and the founding director of the center. His research focuses on misinformation, specifically in and about science. Uh, well, Kate, I'll start with you. I, should I say happy misinformation day? Is there anything happy about misinformation? Uh, not, not typically, but I think uh, what, is, what is hopeful is that we're learning about how to uh, identify it and address it. And I think, you know, if we look back a couple of years, we've made a lot of progress uh, towards, um, towards under, uh, understanding the problem a little bit better and towards um, uh, identifying potential solutions for um, mitigating it in our own lives and then maybe for addressing it in some of our relationships, uh, although it's more complicated than, than our slide here would have you believe. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering, uh, just moving along with this idea that we have identified this as a problem, when it comes to these really personal relationships, our friendships and our family relationships, how seriously should we take it when something like misinformation comes up in a conversation, whether it's online or in person? I think, you know, it, it's difficult um, because a lot of us are, are, um, are, stimulated, agitated in some ways by, by misinformation when we hear it. And for me, one of the things I want to th I try to think about is like, is this worth addressing? If it's something that, you know, is it harmful or is it harmless? Um, if it is harmful, how harmful is it? Is it worth uh, me kind of uh, uh, maybe sacrificing a relationship to try to address it? I think there are cases where it is really important to kind of try to address, especially disinformation, which is in, in, uh, false information or misleading information that's trying to, you know, undermine our trust in, in um, the democratic process, for instance. Uh, and so I think sometimes it really, really is important. But for me, the first thing I try to, to think about is like, is this really important enough? Because I know it's going to be a conversation that's going to be, you know, people are really polarized. They're invested in their ways of seeing the world. And often, misinformation becomes entangled in the ways that we're seeing the world and um, and it can be you know really contentious in relationships to to try to address it even as it's very important so I try to balance like how important is this uh, to address and, and think about how do I do this in a way that I can make sure I maintain the relationship because it's extremely important that we stay together and that we find ways to come together um, in a democratic society uh, at the same time, we want to come together uh, with some kind of shared reality, and those are the kinds of the tensions that that I try to think through when I when I hear misinformation coming from someone that I that, that I care about. Yeah, I really appreciate how well you responded to that question, which may come out of left field, but I think you really um, I identified the challenge, which is really how do we preserve our relationships uh, when this happens, and that that gets to you, Maddie, as we think about. Um, we've clearly identified that someone who's really close to us, that relationship that is, matters to us, is sharing misinformation or disinformation. And so what do we concretely do about this? You know, What kind of things what, do we have to weigh or balance when we're trying to decide whether to have, to have this conversation with someone close to us who believes this? Because that relationship is so crucial. Yeah, it is. It can be very, very difficult. Um, and one thing that's especially tricky, as I'm sure that you're all aware of, is that some of these beliefs are really, really difficult to change. And they're things that you can't just have one conversation and expect to be able to same, change someone's belief. Um, so some of the things that I would think about, um, one of the main things that drives people's beliefs is 
what the people around them believe. So if you encounter a family member that's holding false beliefs, it's likely that the people, that they're in a circle where they're seeing that others, who they're close to are sharing those beliefs. Um, and you can see there's called echo chambers on social media sites where people often are just exposed to other people sharing the same beliefs. And so when they look out, it might seem to them like many, many people are believing the false information that they believe. And so one thing that you can think about doing is not necessarily trying to change someone's belief in one conversation, but kind of change um, their view of how common the belief is. And so even just sharing that you believe something differently and sharing that the people that you're around believe something differently, or maybe there's someone that the family member trusts who also has that view and sharing with them that, hey, like this person that you trust also um, doesn't believe doesn't believe this false information, but believes this. And so that's a way to go about it without having to kind of start an argument with someone, but really just um, show someone that there are other beliefs out there, including your own. And I might also think about how these conversations might not be just a one-time conversation. If there's someone that you're close to, it's likely to come up multiple times. And so just continually to expose the person to other beliefs is something that you can do that might not end up as combative, but is a way to kind of show the other person that um, others out there don't agree with them. And this is generally often how some bigger beliefs are changed. Are changed. So you can think about um, people's attitudes toward gay marriage. And it used to be that a lot more people didn't think that gay marriage should be legalized. But once it was legalized, there was a big shift in people's opinions. Once they saw, oh, look, gay marriage is legalized. Look at all these people who are getting married and look at all these people who are supporting it. That kind of took time. And so when I think about changing people's beliefs, I don't always think about like, we need to have this one conversation where I need to show them what's right. Um, I think about kind of over time, how do we show people that actually there are people that don't agree with them, people that they trust that don't agree with them, people that they're close to and that they respect. Uh, because it's the people who we respect and trust that we look to more for our beliefs. So that's something that I would consider in these conversations um, is not necessarily starting with attacking beliefs, but starting just to to share your own beliefs. Um, that's incredible. That is incredibly useful because what I'm hearing is ultimately what you've you've mentioned with two or three tactics there, and it sounds like what you're trying to do is diversify that person's perspective to get them off that singular track of disinformation to say, hey, look, at, there are other beliefs out there. There's a lot of people who believe otherwise, and here's some credibility behind those alternative beliefs that might get them off that without threatening them their sense of self. So I, I thank you very much for for putting it so succinctly. And and Javin, I want to come to you because you've obviously been on the front lines of this for so long in terms of the research you've done, but I imagine you've also personally engaged in these conversations with friends or loved ones. Uh, as you heard Maddie sharing some of those tactics, um, how useful would they be to you in having those conversations? Well, first I wanna emphasize that this is difficult. You would think as someone who studies this literally night and day and, and for many years of my career and, and and I, I think when it comes to misinformation about science, something I've been sort of tackling since I was a kid in, in many ways, you would think of all people, I would have the answers on how to have these conversations with my friends and my family and my neighbors. And it turns out that I struggle probably as much as anyone else out there. And that sometimes that can be frustrating for me because I think, wait, wait, I'm doing the research, I'm studying this, I see how others are addressing this, I'm reading the research on how to address it and how to address conspiracy theories, I should have the answers. But in these situations, because there's um, someone that you really care on the, other, on, the, on the other side and your emotions get involved, emotions sort of override a lot of our rational thinking a lot of times, and it makes it very difficult to then just apply that that method that you read about in that research that was just published in you know, the, the most recent psychology journal. Um, and so I just wanna emphasize that it is very difficult even for those that are doing research. So if you're having difficulty having these conversations with family and friends, you're a part of the, the same group we're all a part of. But I'll just mention a couple things that I have found useful, both that I can pull from research and from my personal um, conversations where I think I've made some progress. I think, first of all, we really need to have uh, 
this long-term mentality, as, as um, both Maddie and, and Kate have alluded to, playing the long game here when, when talking about these issues, especially in the issues that involve health, um, that involve safety, these kinds of the really important ones, then I, I think, you know, if you come in trying to think that you're going to, to, to solve the problem in one conversation, it'll likely lead to even more failure because you'll get even more um, potentially agitated as will the other individual. So playing the long-term instead of the short-term, I, I think that's really important. And, and I know Maddie already mentioned it too, but I just wanted to emphasize that. Try to pick the situations where you're either one-on-one -on -one or you're in an environment, let's say you're driving in a car and you have a long drive or you're, I don't know, sitting on the uh, you know, chairlift on a ski resort or whatever it is that where you are isolated with that person um, and you're not distracted and that you have an opportunity to, um, to have this conversation. I think um, one of the things that I find quite useful um, not only for misinformation, but for just conversations with people on the bus or people you randomly run into is to find common ground too. You might have a strong disagreement about one particular issue. Let's say it's about vaccinations or some political issue around uh, an election time. But if you can find common ground, for example, we both believe, let's say in education, or we both believe in, in the health of society that benefits us all or whatever it is, Wherever you can find common ground, start there with your discussion. If you start there with that common ground, then you can build on that. And then there'll be a point in which you'll find disagreement, but you have so much already in common with your values and beliefs. I think that becomes very helpful and then making progress. And then just having an agreement that we might, you know, we're going to disagree at some point after you build this common uh, common ground tower, I guess. You're, there's going to be a floor in which you might have, I actually, the metaphor is not so good. You might, um, you're going to find an area where you do disagree. And when you do disagree, I think where you can start to really potentially make progress is really starting with sources. This is how we talk about fact checking in general for an individual, but it's useful, I think, in conversations as well. Who, what organization are you, are you getting this information from? And, and that, that's, that's one place. And then just um, allowing the other to, to speak. Because sometimes um, I think when we wanna throw a whole bunch of facts, we think facts are gonna win it. It's not, it's really, it has to be this two-way street and not just a one-way street. So those are some of the things that help me. But again, even with all those, the, with some of those pointers and many others that we talk about in our center and among you know, our own colleagues, it's still very difficult. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. And that, that's that's really uh, profound and, and very helpful in terms of how you thought about it. And this idea of common ground, obviously, is is to actually start to establish that relationship of trust, so that once you've got that credibility, you can actually introduce other things into the conversation. So I think that's really really thoughtful. Uh, and, and and I come back to you, Kate, on this. And as Jevin's talking about that, this is a long term relationship, but in, in in being able to manage this. But in many ways, when we're involved in these conversations, it feels like it's like for death like if we don't fix this now this person's going to go off the rails or you know the world is going to disintegrate before our eyes and you've talked about this metaphor of throwing a life boy to to friends or family who believe in a certain amount of misinformation disinformation so you've heard from maddie and jevin on this how do you manage this and and not let your emotions get out of check in dealing with something that feels so urgent I, you should ask my you should ask my loved ones this because I even I can give a lot of great advice, but in the moment it can be really really hard. One of the things I try to remind myself is: Do I want to win a conversation or do I want to help? And those are two different approaches. Um, and I don't think w winning winning the conversation is never is is not really going to help in the long run. I also try to approach with a little bit of humility and a lot of empathy. And I, having studied disinformation for a while and misinformation as well. I have seen that we're all vulnerable to spreading false information, especially when we're, um, especially in times of uncertainty and when we're within our, you know, partisan political identities. These are times where where we can can all be vulnerable. And I, when I see someone else spreading what I think is misinformation, I remember back to times when I might have done it, um, and 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 try to, you know. Uh, approach uh, approach from there and and to be honest giving a little ground on that acknowledging that i've made mistakes before can be a really helpful inroad into some of these conversations if in the moment you're telling someone they're going to do something that they've done something wrong their natural inclination is to defend themselves and to and to dig in and so 
uh, and that's not a, a healthy place to start a conversation, especially conversations with such high stakes for health and democracy and other kinds of things. And so for me, it's like humility and empathy. Um, and I can say that, and at times I can remember doing that correctly, but I will, I will readily admit that that's not always possible. And sometimes I get, I get angry, like, how can you think this way? Um, and, and that can be really destructive to relationships. And, uh, and so it, do as I say, not as I do, uh, is one of these things is even when I know the right thing, um, it's not always easy to do that, especially in, in these times where it's so high stakes. That is such a that's such a great way of putting it, and and yeah, we should not try to see this as a as a battle that we have to win, uh, because that's really what gets us into trouble. So I think that that's a really great way of positioning it. I I recently read a quote from the British author Jonathan Swift from three hundred years ago. He said, "It's useless to attempt to reason a man out of a thing he was never reasoned into." And so, as Jevin was saying, no, throwing facts at some at an emotional conversation isn't going to do anything. And 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 Maddie just listening. To, to Kate and Jevin on, on this and their solutions, it makes me wonder uh, how much our sense of self and identity is tied to these conversations, both in terms of the person bringing the misinformation to the conversation and our attempts to sort of fix that and to fix that person. And, and how, how do you think about it personally when you engage in these conversations, recognizing that our sense of self is very much at stake here, or it feels like it's at stake? Yes, um, I would agree with that. Um, so a lot of times these beliefs are not just these isolated pieces of information that people believe. They're these beliefs that are tied into someone's values, into someone's uh, social connections with others, into someone's group identity. And so when you start these conversations in terms of like a me versus you, it becomes this sense of like you're one person and I'm another person and this clash of identities. Um, but it's likely that you also share identities and values, like Jevin was mentioning, um, there are values that you have in common. And so starting the conversation in that common ground, I would also say is very important when you consider the role of these identities um, and being empathetic toward the person like Kate was saying and kind of acknowledging that we all can hold these false beliefs. Uh, something else that I would recommend that could be helpful, which may be the last thing that you wanna do when someone shares misinformation um, would be to acknowledge the other person's beliefs. Um, and that's something that can be helpful in terms of starting the conversation on the right foot, saying, I know this issue is really important to you. It's something that um, is, you know, is something that might affect you a lot. It's something that's concerning. Like I understand how important this is and that this is um, what you believe. And so starting that conversation with that acknowledgement and that, that um, sense of acknowledging the other person's values and beliefs uh, can go a long way in having these conversations. But it's something that is hard to do when you're emotional in, in the moment. And so that's, um, that's easier said than done, but that's something else that I would consider. And I would, yeah. I would echo what Jevin says about starting with this kind of shared identity. So maybe you're liberal and someone else is Republican. Um, but you know, you're both students on the same sports team and you both care about doing well in academics and you both care about taking um, care of others. And so shifting the conversation from being me versus you, me as a liberal, you as a Republican, or you know, me as a Republican, you as a liberal to kind of this, you know, we're both, we're both people in this situation. And I understand that this is something that's really important to you. Um, could be one way to go about this. Yeah, that's that's great. I see you. I hear you. You recognize that person as a human. That those beliefs are important to that person. So, so I think that's a really thoughtful way of putting it. Jeff, we just have a, a frankly, it's been it's gone very quickly. But we just have a minute left. And I just want to bring this final question to you. So, what are best practices? It's just supporting people on these conversations around on social media specifically, knowing that it's not just identity, but it's association with the group that is meaningful to those people. Yeah, I mean, when you when you start talking about identity, it yeah, it that that's that's one of the reasons why this is so difficult to dislodge people from beliefs, assuming that they are, let's say, wrong beliefs. I mean, sometimes we think you're right and then then they are wrong. But I think one thing that that is helpful more so in person, I, I tend to think that these 
sensitive conversations with family and friends tend to be better offline, but uh, we'll, we'll assume that they kind of work online as well. One thing that works uh, that I found that, that helps as well, and this comes also from the literature, uh, is being curious, it's sort of entering these conversations with, um, with questions, uh, genuine questions about what the, the, this group believes, since they're a member that they can then help you understand their, their, their world that they've been sort of living in and sort of, and going in with a, as a, a curious, let's say, as a curious librarian rather than, in, than, a, than an interrogative lawyer uh, is going to, to sort of help you a lot more. And I, and I really, I mean, I'm, I think a lot of us are curious by nature. I certainly consider myself that, and maybe I push it too much by asking all these questions, but I really feel that when I ask questions and I engage with what what they're seeing, why they're seeing it, um, and why this you know this person, whether it's a family member or friend, um, where you know why they believe that and, and how they got to those conclusions, and I and you have to be careful about it so it doesn't sound like you're pandering um, them. I, I think that just being curious, being curious about what led to their beliefs uh, or or where what else they're seeing. Um, and then engaging in that way, and then and then kind of picking your battles, maybe picking after you've heard the explanations to the questions, figuring out which of the issues that you think you can engage in after you've asked questions about, well, um, yeah, wh what else are, are people seeing right now? It, let's say in mainstream media that's bothering them, or or what are some what are what are the most common things you're talking about right now in your social group? And then they'll say, well, this is the thing that we're hearing. We're hearing a lot about you know, some of these research studies out of the CDC that, um, you know, are, are now just being released. Why is that, you know, then we, okay, then we can engage on it. Because starting with questions rather than statements about what I'm going to tell you, um, I have found uh, can be helpful too. So I guess that the point there is be curious rather than interrogative. So Kate, we just heard from Jevin saying, be curious as we engage with our friends and family. Uh, and you say we should throw people life buoy. Does that mean we get in the water with them? <laughs> right. So I, I think curiosity is really important as qu that kind of approach with humility and with questions. But I think we also have to protect ourselves as well. Um, mis and disinformation can be very disorienting and confusing. And so I like to say, I'll, I'll throw you the life buoy, but I'm not going to jump in the water with you. Um, if you feel yourself being pulled down the rabbit hole with your loved one, that's a place where you might want to put up um, put up some protections for yourself. Uh, in those conversations. So approach with curiosity in the sense that you're having a conversation, you wanna learn about why they think that, but do realize that these can be really compelling arguments in some cases and, um, and you know, they're, just be careful um, with, your own, with your own mental health and with your own sort of capacity to make sense of these very confusing information spaces. Well, Kate, I think that's a really good way to close. I mean, we, we're ultimately trying to preserve these relationships with our friends and family. So this idea of approaching them with humility, of recognizing their identity, and this idea of, you know, a, a sort of a, a measured curiosity really helps us have these conversations and, and, and manage this situation around misinformation and disinformation on Misinformation Day. So Jevin, Kate, and Maddie, thanks so much for your insights. Thanks so much, Hanson. Thank you. Thank you, Hanson.